I love how that image, uh, how that video ends with that image of the tree in a snowy field like that. It looks cold, but it does look restful. Perhaps you've taken advantage of some of the beautiful snow and a chance to take a walk in the uh, winter in the, in the silence and just enjoy some rest. And as we've been talking about the rhythm of rest, what Sabbath really means for those of us who follow Jesus, we're glad you've chosen to join us, whether you're joining us on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel or the website. We're glad you're with us. We hope that you can experience God's grace and he speaks to you through his word. Now, if you've been with us for a while, you'll know I'm Pastor Jeff and I, I've been away for a couple of weeks. Uh, and just to let you know, because some of you have heard and some of you have been asking, my wife and I had a little getaway plan for her birthday and for mine at the first of the year, and then we came back and we found out that we were both COVID positive. Uh, so uh, we're very grateful that we've recovered. We had very mild symptoms, and we're thankful for that and appreciate the prayers. But wanted to let you know where I've been and what's been going on. Finished the quarantine and praising God that I'm healthy and able to be here with you now. Um, and it, last couple of weeks, you heard from Pastor Brian and Pastor Sterling. And let me just say, I'm, I'm so thankful for the preaching team we have here. It's a humbling thing to get to work with and lead these men as we talk through the, pe- the passages and the texts each week. And I learn from them. I grow from them. In the last couple of weeks, it's been a privilege for me to sit under their teaching, as all of you have. And so we've been looking at this thing called Sabbath, rhythm of rest. In the, uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Brian began talking about rest or Sabbath is woven into the fabric of creation. It was there in the beginning. God orchestrated it and put it into the rhythm of how he made all that exists. It's made for us. And then Pastor Sterling last week talked to us about the command. Sabbath is, is one of the big ten, the ten commandments. It's unique in the, of the ten, that it's the only one of the commandments that is, begins with the word remember. Remember the Sabbath day because we tend to forget. Sabbath is that weekly reminder that you don't run the world and everything doesn't depend on you. And this is something we all need to be reminded of and we easily forget. And so we have a weekly rhythm and a reminder of who's really in charge, who's the one that we rest in, and it all doesn't depend on us. This is what it means to remember the Sabbath day. So today, we're going to shift and look not at the Old Testament, although we could spend many more weeks looking at Old Testament passages on Sabbath. We're going to look at the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, and see what does Jesus have to say about the Sabbath. In fact, many of Jesus' teachings take place in the context of the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, or about the Sabbath day, and I don't think that's a coincidence. We're going to look at Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through chapter 3, verse 6. There's a couple of stories put together here that give us a picture of Jesus' view of Sabbath law and what it means for those who will follow him. Let's read this passage. Mark chapter 2. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately had held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Okay, two incidents back to back, both involving the Sabbath. They're linked together in part because in both incidents, Jesus is questioned and challenged by these religious leaders, the Pharisees, uh, about the Sabbath, particularly about his, Jesus' understanding and keeping or lack of keeping of the Sabbath law. In the second encounter, there's this man with a withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, which was the custom. He went to synagogue on the Sabbath to hear Torah read and taught and to worship God together. The Pharisees completely missed the point. This is a classic case of missing the forest for the trees, spiritually speaking. 
Because the Sabbath, at its core, is about restoration, wholeness, healing, being restored. That's the word actually used. The man's hand is restored. So when the man is healed, this is exactly what Sabbath is about, physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. And they miss it, these Pharisees. The reason Jesus is so angry and so grieved, we're told, at their hardness of heart, is the reality is that their hearts were more withered than the man's hand. They totally miss what's, who this is and what this is all about. And they're, they're supposed to be the religious teachers, the religious leaders, the spiritual guides of God's people, the ones who are pointing people to the God who gives life. Now, it's easy when we read about the Pharisees, and we've looked at them a number of times in recent weeks, to be, uh, to be judgmental of them, to think, what is wrong with them? How could they miss it? But as a pastor, I often need to press pause and think, what is it that I miss? Do I miss, spiritually speaking, the forest for the trees sometimes? What would Jesus say to me about the point of it all that maybe I miss, maybe you miss, so why do they miss it? The, in one answer, they miss it because of religion. They miss it because of religion. Let me explain. The Pharisees had broken the Sabbath down into 39 categories, or 39 types of work that you could not do, including picking grain in the field, which we read about in the first incident, including certain kinds of healing. Uh, they had 39 categories of work that were off limits. Even today, Orthodox Jews uh, will... will um, this is why they walk everywhere on the Sabbath, because starting a fire, kindling a flame, is part of working. And so to, to turn a key ignition is to light a spark, which would be similar to starting a fire. So you see how technical and serious you can get about keeping the Sabbath, which is meant to restore us and give us life. And instead, in their effort to keep God's law, they had made it a, a crushing burden, an impossible code that no one could keep perfectly. So they're watching Jesus to see if they can accuse him for breaking the Sabbath, all the while missing the miracle, the healing, the restoration that's taking place. And the whole, uh, the whole encounter is summed up in this one verse. Let's look at it, uh, verse two, chapter 2, verse 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. This is key. Not man for the Sabbath. What does that mean? It sounds like a simple, straightforward sentence, but it's really profound for us. And it's crucial to understanding what Sabbath is all about and what the law of God is all about in the life of a believer. Jesus is saying, Sabbath is made for you. If something's made for you, that means it's a gift. It's meant to give you, it's to be for you, to give you something, blessing and enjoyment and satisfaction. But if you were made for it, you become its servant. You see the difference? The Sabbath is made for you, to be a blessing to you, to give you joy and fulfillment, not you to serve and labor under some law that you can't keep. And there's all the difference in the world in this simple statement. This is the very heart of the gospel, this is the very center of what it means for those of us, the, how the law of God functions in the heart of a Christian. Is the law of God to you a burden, a, a weight of guilt, or is it a gift? Is it joy? Is it, as David calls it, sweeter than honey and delight? Most of us don't think of it that way. But the Sabbath is part of God's law, and it's meant to be a delight to us. This is what Jesus is getting at here. God's law is a gift that shows us the path of life. Let me, and really what we have here is two contrasting paradigms. Let's look at these two paradigms. On the one hand, human religion. We'll unpack that in a minute. And on the other hand, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're not at all alike. Human religion is performance-based. The gospel is grace-based. Performance and grace are not just different, they're diametrically opposed to each other. They don't go together. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is not just different from religion. It is the opposite of. It's the antithesis of. You might even say it's hostile to it. This is crucial. All human religions are essentially based on some kind of performance. I think most people in the world today basically believe that if there's a God, you relate to him by doing good, by obeying his law, by by being a good person. All human religions function on this principle. Now, there's a million different variations. Some of them are nationalistic, meaning join this people group, become part of this tribe or this nation or this culture, and then you're in the favored, the, good, the, the chosen, uh, the holy ones. Some of them are uh, spiritualistic. Have these experiences, perform these rituals, and you'll be transformed. Some of them are moralistic. Behave this way, keep these laws like the Pharisees, and then you'll be acceptable. But it's all essentially performance-based. Join this group, do these things, obey these laws, follow these rules, pray these prayers. It's spiritual ladder climbing. I'm going to do and pray and say and join and be good enough to, to ascend, to balance the cosmic scales in my favor, to come out on the good side. That's human religion. And it has nothing to do with the gospel. Let me put it this way. Religion works like this. I obey, therefore I am accepted. I do what's required, whether it's joining the group or performing the rituals or praying the prayers or keeping the laws or the rules, whatever it is, I do what's required and I'm accepted. I'm a good person, so God must treat me as such. The gospel is, I'm accepted. Right in my brokenness and sin, I'm accepted through Christ, therefore I obey. It liberates me to obey. I'm not obeying to accomplish something. I'm obeying because I've been set free to do so. Now, we talk about this all the time around here. And perhaps you're hearing this and you're thinking, yeah, 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 I know that. I just want to caution you. Knowing it up here is not the same thing as knowing it in here. There's a drift in every one of our hearts toward religion, toward performance. You can be religious about anything. And Jesus, in these passages and all throughout the New Testament, is calling us back to the gospel, calling us by his grace, inviting us to rest in him. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not just different from religion, it's the opposite of it. Let me put it to you this way. Jesus did not come to reform human religion, but to put an end to it and to replace it with himself. Jesus did not come to to reform it, you know, to clean it up, to make it a little better, to readjust it, to aim it in a new direction. No, to do away with it because religion is death and to replace it with himself. That's what the gospel is. He is the one in whom we trust. You see, for the religious person, the purpose of the law is to give you the parameters, the boundaries in which you know that you're okay. You know that you're good enough, that you measure up. But for the Christian, for those who belong to Jesus, the purpose of the law is to cause you to throw yourself on the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. Because you know you can't keep the law. And receive his forgiveness and grace. And then, only then, does the law become a delight and a pathway to life. And learning to keep the Sabbath is really about learning to rest in the truth of the gospel, learning to rest in Jesus, the grace and the acceptance of Jesus. Learning to keep the Sabbath is to cease performing, to cease trying to measure up, and to rest in the one who has done it all for us. There's lots of ways to illustrate this. One of my favorite comes from a movie that um, some of you by your generation, like mine and older, will know. Others of you maybe not so familiar. I would encourage all of you, if you haven't seen it, to go and watch the movie Chariots of Fire. Chariots of Fire is a remarkable story. It's really a story about two uh, contrasting characters, Eric Liddell and Harold Abrams, both uh, British Olympic sprinters in the 1924 Paris Olympics. Uh, but they're, that's about all they share in common. Well, they both want to win the gold. They're both very talented, and they both are working very hard, so they have that in common. But here's the difference. Liddell is a deeply committed Christian who has a calling to go on the mission field to China. This is Liddell on the, on, 
on the right, your left side uh, of the image, holding the baton there. And he, um, he's a, an overachiever, you would say. Not a pretty runner, he said, but, a, but a, a deeply courageous one and desperately wants to win the gold. But he won't run on the Sabbath. And interestingly in the story, this is based on a true story, his qualifying heat in the Olympics was on a Sunday and he refused to run it. So they put him in a different race, which he eventually won. Harold Abrams, on the other hand, on the other side here, um, he was a secular Jew um, and didn't care much to keep the Sabbath either way, but his life was wrapped up in performance. And there's a couple of salient lines in the movie that are just brilliant. They illustrate this point. Abrams says on the being um, warmed up by his trainer right before his 100-meter uh, final in the 1924 Olympics, he says this, I'm forever in pursuit and I don't even know what I'm chasing. And when the gun goes off, I feel like I have 10 seconds to justify my whole existence. 10 lonely seconds to justify my whole existence. What a statement. He says, my whole life, I feel like I'm forever in pursuit, and I don't really know what I'm chasing. All I know is when the gun goes off, I've got 10 seconds to, to prove that I matter, that I'm somebody, to justify my existence. Listen to what Liddell says. There's this scene for Liddell when he's with his sister Jenny, who, who doesn't want him to run. She thinks it's a waste of time. She wants him to go serve God on the mission field in China. And he's trying to explain to her why, why God has called him to do both. And they take, he's from Scotland. They take a walk in the hills of Scotland. It's a beautiful scene. And he says, Jenny, I've decided. I'm going to China to serve God. And she's pleased. And he goes, but I've got a lot of running to do first. And she's all de depressed. And he says, you've got to understand, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Oh, I love that line. I think about it often. What a contrast. When I run, I feel his pleasure, the pleasure of God, versus I've got 10 seconds to justify my whole existence. You see the difference? That's the difference between the gospel and and religion. Let me ask you, when's the last time you felt the pleasure of God in your life? You felt God's pleasure in you, surrounding you, holding you. Or maybe you relate much more to Harold Abrams. My whole life I'm in pursuit and I don't even know what I'm chasing. And I'm trying to prove and justify my existence. Sabbath is all about feeling the pleasure of God, enjoying him, resting in him. That's why, God, it was, that's why it was made for us, Jesus says. You see how these two paradigms are totally opposed to each other. You might even say these are hostile to each other. They, they can't coexist. You can't have a little religion and a little gospel. They, 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 they're at war in our soul. It's one or the other. One's a path to life, and one's a burden, a burden and a weight that leads to destruction. Let's go back and look at verses 4 through 6 of uh, Mark chapter 3. This is the story of the healing of the man with the withered hand. This is something fascinating happens here that highlights this opposition. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? Now remember, Sabbath is about restoration, wholeness, healing. So it's an it should be an obvious answer. But they were silent. Yeah, they don't want to answer because they know where it's going. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched his, it out, and his hand was restored. That's the purpose of Sabbath right there, restoring. The Pharisees went out, now this is shocking, and immediately held counsel with the Herodians. I want you to look at these two groups right here. Pharisees and Herodians on how to destroy him. These two groups plot together on how to get rid of Jesus. This, this is astounding, friends. This, let me give you a little context in case you don't, aren't familiar. Um, we've talked about the Pharisees before. The Pharisees are religious and political and social conservatives. Their, uh, their way of keeping people uh, faithful and resisting the Roman Empire and all of its influences, secular influences and pagan influences, was to keep people faithful to the Torah, the law of God. The Herodians were nothing like that. 
You remember Herod, King Herod, Herod the Great? Uh, there were actually three Herods in the life of Jesus. These are the Herodian kings, descendants of Herod, the Herodian dynasty. The Herodians were Hellenistic Jews. Hellenism is the term for Greek culture. When Rome came and conquered an area and occupied a territory, they brought with them Hellen, Hellenistic culture, Greek, Greco-Roman Greek culture, Greek way of thinking, Greek view of, of the body and, and, and sexuality, Greek paganism and polytheism and pluralism and relativism. And all of this was an offense to the Jewish mind. So the Pharisees' way of, rege- of resisting was to stay pure and holy and resist this corrupting secular pagan pluralistic influence. But the Herodians were Hellenistic Jews. They aligned with the Hellenism and they were in league with Rome, supporters of the Roman Empire. In other words, these two groups had nothing in common at all, except they both wanted to get rid of Jesus. They both wanted to do away with him. Why? They have no category for what he's talking about, who he's claiming to be. In my experience, most of the people who reject Christianity do so because they think Christianity and religion are the same thing. And they don't want it. They're not interested. Let me just say that if that's you, if you're watching and that's you, if you've rejected Christianity because of the behavior of Christians or because you think it's like every other religion, you're wrong. Respectfully, humbly, graciously, I think you're wrong. I think you're rejecting something and someone that does, you don't really understand. Not fully. Not truly. What we see here in this combination of Pharisees and Herodians is that the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't line up with either the ultra-conservative religious view or the secular progressive view. It doesn't fit in either category. And this is why there's so much tension in the church politically these days because we're trying to fit the gospel into one side of the aisle or the other, the right or the left, and it won't fit. It defies our categories completely, shatters them. It did in the first century, and it does in the 21st century. Let's look at verse 28 of chapter 2. This is a simple statement Jesus makes when he's talking about The Sabbath was made for you, not you for the Sabbath. And then he says this, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That sounds pretty straightforward. But this is an astounding claim. It's a claim to divinity. It's part of the reason the Herodians and the Pharisees combined together and plotted against Jesus, how they could get rid of him. It's a shocking thing. Jesus is not telling us where to find our rest. He's not telling us how to get rest. He's not teaching us the way of rest. He's saying, I am your rest. I'm Lord of rest. The Lord of rest. The Lord of Sabbath. I think the combination here of the Lordness of Jesus and the Sabbathness of Jesus is really important. He is Lord. He is God. He's also Sabbath, rest, wholeness, restoration, peace, satisfaction. He's both. There's a fascinating passage in Matthew's gospel just before the same account. If you're new to reading the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, three of them, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the synoptic gospels because they share many of the same stories. They tell them in in slightly different uh, versions. In Matthew's version, right before these two stories we just read, there's this fascinating little account in, in chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Let's read it. Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Boy, if you you, um, like to highlight or underline or memorize, I would just encourage you, circle, star, highlight, underline this passage. Commit it to memory. This is deeply profound. It goes to the very heart of the gospel we've been talking about. Let's unpack it. Here the Lord of the Sabbath is giving an invitation, a call to rest. Come to me, he says. And we can't respond to this invitation unless we understand what this is all about, what he's really saying here. When the Bible calls us to rest, 
there are really uh, a couple things going on. Um, first, uh, there, there's two levels. The first level is to stop or cease activity. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks. God rested from his work. He ceased the work of creation on the seventh day. We're commanded one day a week to set aside our, our striving and our frantic running around trying to earn it all and achieve it all and accomplish it all and to remember who, who we belong to. Stop something. But the deeper meaning is to be satisfied in. Let me explain. Why did God rest on the seventh day? Why did God rest? Well, obviously, not because he was exhausted. He's omnipotent. He never gets exhausted. He's the all-powerful one. So he wasn't tired. He didn't need to refuel. Neither is it really to give us an example. I mean, it is an example for us, but he didn't rest just to show us what to do. Let me give it, put it to you this way. Recently, I, I like to watch uh, random YouTube videos of people that are good at building things. I'm not very good at that, but I imagine that I am. And I was watching a series of, of uh, YouTube videos about this guy building cabin in the wilderness, in the Alaska wilderness, Dick Prennicky, perhaps you've seen it, One Man's Journey in the, in the Alaska Wilderness. And then I got kind of into the rabbit hole of watching videos of guys building and living in their off-the-grid life. And I watched the video of this guy building this uh, beautiful wooden canoe. Gorgeous, fashioned it, shaped the wood, hollowed out parts of it and built it. And I watched him seal it and all with natural and with hand tools. And I just thought, wow, that's amazing. And when he finished it, what do you think he did? What do you think he did with that beautiful canoe he built? Well, of course, he just hung it on a wall and walked away. No, he took it for, a, he went out in the canoe on this beautiful stream out onto this lake paddling away. That's what you do. Well, think about that. The work of creating the canoe, building it, creating and then you, at, at some point, that's finished. You cease that, and what do you do? You step in. You go for a, a ride. You enjoy it. You, you're satisfied in it. You experience it. So there's a sense in which when God rested on the seventh day, it's because there was no more work to do. It was, it was very good, he said. And he's satisfied in his creation. He enjoys his creation. And in a sense, what the Bible's saying to you and to me is that when we practice Sabbath, we're stepping into the canoe. We're getting in and going for a paddle with God, resting in him, enjoying what he has done. What did Jesus say on the cross when he hung there? It is finished. It's finished. I've accomplished it. You and I can't add anything to that. All of our striving, all of our performing, all of our effort adds nothing. In fact, it only detracts from it. The only thing we can do is step in and enjoy and be satisfied and know that we rest in what he has done. That's the offer here to you and to me. Notice, who does Jesus say his rest is for? He says it's for all who labor and are heavy laden. The New International Version says, all those who are weary and burdened. All who are weary and burdened. Well, anybody weary? Do I even have to ask? Anybody feeling a burden? Carrying a burden? That's all of us. We're all weighed down. We're all weary and heavy laden. And we all labor in all seasons particularly in this season, I think we're more acutely aware of our weariness and the heaviness that we all carry. So Jesus' answer to our burdens is something he calls a yoke. Jesus' answer to our burdens is his yoke. Remember what he says? Take my yoke upon you, for my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he says. Now, it's not an egg yoke, Y-O-L-K, but a yoke, Y-O-K-E, a yoke for oxen. You'll see an image of a yoke here. To be yoked is to be joined to and pull in, head in, go in the same direction. That's why the oxen are bound into this yoke and driven. They're pulling in the same direction. So 
this is obvious if you grew up on a farm or you've seen images of this, and it was certainly obvious in Jesus' day. But it came to be a metaphor that rabbis used for those who came to be their disciples. If you wanted to be a disciple of a rabbi, to follow this rabbi with your life, then you took on that rabbi's yoke. You were joined to, bound to, pulling in, going in the same direction as that rabbi. Meaning you willfully submitted to the teachings, interpretations, traditions, and way of life of that rabbi. That's his, that was what they meant by his yoke. The Pharisees, their yoke was so heavy. Now, out of a desire to keep the law, they created a religion that was a burden, that was crushing people. And Jesus is saying, why don't we trade yokes? Why don't you give me that one, and I'll give you mine? See, all who are weary and heavy laden, there's nobody that's out from under this. We're all carrying a burden. We're just, he, Jesus is just saying, why don't we trade? Why don't you give me yours and I'll give you mine? And what's his? It's accomplished. It's done. The scripture says he's already borne your griefs and sorrows. He's already borne your burdens. He's paid for it. He's done it. So trade. Why would we refuse it? Think about it for just a minute. If that's really the offer, forget the institutional stuff. Forget all the social media attacks on evangelical Christianity. Forget all that for a minute. Just consider that Jesus is saying to you, Right now, give me your burdens. Give me that yoke you've been carrying around. I want it. Hand it to me. And take mine on you because it's light and easy and you'll find rest. Why would you refuse that? To refuse it is, is it's like a, a drowning man at sea. And you throw that person a life preserver. And they say, what are you doing? It's hard enough to keep my head above water here drowning without the burden of a life preserver. It makes no sense, right? Of course you receive that. It's life. It's salvation. It's hope. That's what we're being offered here. But think about it for a minute. Jesus is saying, he's a rabbi, take my yoke upon you. He's saying the way that you find rest is to take on my life. Meaning, make me the center of your life. Surrender your right to self-determination, to have your way, to fulfill your desires. Become surrendered and submit, submitted to me, and then you will find rest and peace. This actually makes no sense to our, our me-centered culture. It sounds crazy, and it would be crazy if not for the fact that the person who makes that offer says he is Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of rest. We're all burdened. Jesus says, take my non-yoke upon you. Give me your burdens. Let me unburden your soul. Recently, when I was um, away on our little vacation, <laughs> trying to get some rest, quote unquote, I read a book by a pastor named Dane Ortland. He works for Crossway Publishing and is a pastor uh, in a nearby city and wrote a book called uh, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. I, I highly recommend it to you. Uh, it's, it's really fantastic. Nothing in it that I read was completely new to me, but he unpacked the heart of God in a way that struck me in, 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 a, in an entirely new way. The information wasn't new, but the way he presented it was transformational for me, and I'm so grateful for it. And he talks about this very passage uh, as the heart of his, the title of his book. Let me read to you a quote from the book. And when Jesus tells us what animates him most deeply, what is most true of him, do you hear that? What is most true of Jesus? When he exposes the innermost recesses of his being, what we find there is gentle and lowly. Who could have ever thought up such a savior. The point in saying that Jesus is lowly is that he is accessible. For all of his resplendent glory and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness, no one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. You don't need to unburden or collect yourself and then come to Jesus. Your very burden is what qualifies you to come. No payment is required. He says, I will give you rest. His rest is gift, not transaction. I love that. 
The rest of Jesus Christ is not a transaction, not something you achieve or acquire or earn. It is sheer grace, sheer gift. All the talk throughout the Bible about Sabbath, woven into the fabric of creation in the Genesis account, commanded to us in the Ten Commandments, right on down to Jesus, is really given to us for one thing, that we might cease our striving and performing, trying to earn, and rest in who he is and what he's done. Live our lives that way. And I know that for some of you, you've gotten away from that. You've drifted into back into religion and you feel like you're trying to perform and you're on a never-ending treadmill. Step off. Unburden. Take on his yoke once again. For some of you, I'm, I'm going to guess there are many watching who don't know that rest at all, have never known it. You think Christianity is one more religion, one more set of rules, philosophies, principles, good ideas, good teachings to follow, to keep, to measure up to. That is not at all the gospel. That is not who Jesus is. He didn't give, come to give you more advice, to be your life coach, to give you a set of rules. He came to give you life in him, in what he has already done. I urge you, if that's you, turn to Jesus. Turn to him now. He will receive you freely. He alone will unburden your soul. He alone will heal and restore the broken parts of of your life and your heart. He alone will give you rest. He alone is Lord of the Sabbath. Make him your Lord and your Savior today. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are Lord of the Sabbath. Forgive us for seeking our rest in all the wrong places. Forgive our striving and performing and our self-sufficiency. Lord, help us to take off the burden and the yoke of our past sins, of our impossible standards, of our shame, of the abuse we've suffered. All those things we carry around which weigh us down, you take from us by your grace. Teach us by your spirit to rest in you. And Lord, for those hearing this right now who don't know your grace and mercy, I pray right now they would turn to you. You will receive them. You do receive them. You forgive. You heal. You restore. That is what Sabbath is about. And that is what you call us to. All who weary and are burdened, may we turn to you, Lord Jesus, and find our rest. Amen.